So I noticed smokestacks on smokestacks on smokestacks, but when it, and a lot of environmental pollution. But when the time came for those industries that your family worked for to take more ownership and responsibility to curb the rates of this pollution, the industries were largely silent. But pollution doesn't just happen in the air, it also gets um, into the environment everywhere, including the soil, with often deathly consequences. You've noticed that many of your community members have higher rates of a lot of diseases um, compared to neighboring areas. There's been some hope since the Environmental Protection Agency, or as we usually say, the EPA, declared your neighborhood in North Birmingham what they call a Superfund site meaning the government is the one that takes ownership of cleaning up the toxins as opposed to the industries when they don't really know who's responsible. But with the legislatures now untangling decades of corrupt Alabama politics that have influenced the EPA's progress, you and other residents in your neighborhood have been left wondering if help can come any sooner. So this is where a lot of my work comes in. So we're talking about pollution and heavy metal contamination in the soil. And so you may know that soil um, is ground up rocks and silt and, and, um, and sand, lots of what we call inorganic material. And in the case of North Birmingham and other contaminated sites, it also has heavy metal pollutants like um, manganese and iron. But I want you to think that soil, or think about the fact that soil isn't just all this inorganic, not alive stuff. It's actually brimming with life. Um, little creatures that we call, and you may be familiar with, uh, we call them bacteria. So bacteria have very important roles in soil. Um, they help plants uptake nutrients. They create their own ecosystems. And in fact, uh, just sort of an aside here, um, bacteria in the soil are actually where we get clinical antibiotics from. So they create chemicals that help fend off other bacteria. They're sort of living in these um, competitive ecosystems with each other. It wasn't until around the 40s that scientists realized that they can take some of those compounds and use them clinically to fight off infections. So I really just want you to be aware that soil is made up of both non-living and living things. And I'll come back to antibiotics here in a second. So bacteria are unicellular organisms. Um, they're very, very diverse, but even though they're really, really small, they can have a huge impact on the environment and on human health. So let's look inside of one bacteria. There's lots of stuff that I'm omitting for simplicity, but I just want you to think about bacteria having um, DNA or genetic code that encodes for special machines called proteins. And on this regular DNA, um, these proteins help sort of the bacteria's everyday life in the same way that our DNA helps us make um, proteins. These protein machinery sort of everyday life stuff includes breaking down our foods and creating energy, creating energy for movement. So I want you to think about this general DNA being specific to each bacteria, but really just concerning what, just concerning what the bacteria does on a day-to-day -day basis. But a lot of bacteria have these extra types of DNA that are often found in circles or circular DNA called plasmids. And so on these plasmids, they're, they're very similar to the other types of sort of regular DNA, but these plasmids enable the creation of special proteins that sort of give these bacteria superpowers or bonus abilities that other types of bacteria may not have. So I was talking about antibiotics. So usually the DNA that codes for the creation and resistant patterns of those are in fact found on these sort of like bonus DNA parts called plasmids and not the regular DNA. Bacteria have this special ability to inject plasmids in each other and uptake them from the environment. So it's actually really important that we're studying them. Okay, so what happens when a heavy metal um, particle like iron gets into a bacterial cell in the soil? In fact, they can just pump it out if on their plasmid, they have a special piece of DNA that encodes for that pump protein. So the, the pump protein here is in the little um, yellow trapezoid. If the, again, if the heavy metal contamination gets into the cell, it can just pump it out. And so we expect that bacteria will be able to do this if they're in places like North Birmingham that are used to heavy metal contamination. 
this is more than likely the type of bacteria that are living in these environments. But something else that we think is critical to study in the North Birmingham area is these pumps also being used for something else, and that is antibiotics. We know from laboratory studies that antibiotics that get into bacterial cells, they can use those same exact proteins to pump out the antibiotics as they use to pump out the heavy metals. So we're talking about a cross-resistant strategy, one protein that can pump out anything. And so I talked about how antibiotics are actually um, chemical compounds that bacteria use. So they're not, they don't actually look like pills. It's sort of just what, what, we're used, what we are used to them looking like. Right, and so for my project, um, me and my undergraduate um, assistant, Kusha Roberts, went around to six public locations in the 35207 or polluted neighborhoods in North Birmingham, as well as um, six public areas in a neighboring zip code that was not known for industrial contamination. So what we did was take all of those samples and we prepared them back at the lab. And what we're really trying to figure out and compare in the North Birmingham area to the other neighborhood is to figure out if the bacterial communities are in fact different. And I've indicated this by coloring them slightly differently. We also want to figure out if the bacteria in the 35207 zip code do in fact have these special proteins and the genes that encode for them. So this is what we predict we will find when we do an analysis of the bacteria in the soil. So there's two big approaches um, that we can do when we're analyzing bacteria in soil. In fact, this, these are the same approaches that researchers who study the microbiome also use. So Dr. McMahon was talking about wet lab approaches. So if you're familiar with that term, um, another way to think about it in microbiology is called culture dependent. So that's really when we're putting a very small amount of dirt on a petri dish, so a little piece of plastic that contains food that bacteria can grow on. We can spread a lot of them out on a petri dish and see a very um, wide array of different types of species. And then we can just sort of pick one up with a toothpick and start using it for other tests. We can then um, figure out if they are in fact cross resistant to antibiotics and heavy metals. And this is a really important way of experimenting. But it, it's important because it tells us what the bacteria are physiologically capable of, or in other words, what they're doing in nature. But something that this, this approach really falls short of is it doesn't really tell us what the entire community is made up of. So another way of thinking about this is it, it would sort of be like um, the US census right now trying to take a census of the entire global population by just looking at the people who are currently in coffee shops. Like, yes, that does represent a population, although it will be less than 0.1% of the entire human population because most of us don't go to coffee shops during pandemics, right? So we're really losing out on a lot of the different types of bacteria that are in those bags of soil. And so this is what Dr. McMahon was talking about in terms of um, dry lab work or bioinformatics, we can think about um, this approach called culture independent. So the petri dishes are called cultures or, or the use of bacteria on petri dishes are called cultures. When we're not using those, it's called culture independent. And so the first thing we can do is extract the DNA from the soil. Um, it's actually a lot more complicated than just putting it through a filtration system but really ultimately that's what I'm doing with several different types of chemicals. And then we can sequence the DNA, which basically means that we can use special programs to read out all of the different types of DNA representing all of the different types of bacteria in each bag of soil. And then we can analyze it using special computer software and interpret it and figure out certain aspects about the community structure or the different types of bacteria. And so remember how I talked about there being two different types of DNA in a lot of bacterial cells. So what might you expect uh, the other type of DNA is that we study? Hopefully you're thinking plasmids. So we can do the, the same exact um, procedure with just the plasmid DNA. And this one is a lot more complicated and it actually requires um, a lot more chloroform than I've ever been used to working with. 
and because we're also in this case trying to take out the regular DNA. And then we can sequence the plasmid and study if it has any of those DNA markers on it that indicate that it has those pump functions. Now, I do want to say this is about where um, I had to stop working because we all got sent home. Um, so I was pretty excited to get the uh, little tubes with what I think are just the plasmid DNA. And when, we, when I get to return to work, I will be able to send those off for sequencing so we can analyze them. So I did just want to briefly talk about the results we've gotten from ju just this part of the experiment. And I really did want to give a shout out here because a lot of these results um, were done in partnership with the microbial ecology class um, taught in 2019 by Dr. Jeff Morris. And I think there, there are many students from that class um, watching this right now. I'm Melissa Walker, Sabrina Heiser, Aisha O'Connor, sorry to call you out, but anyway, very grateful that you took that class and you went through it because I love your data, it's great. So what we found, what a lot of the students have found and what I'm continuing to work on when we analyze this, is we find that there are slightly different bacterial communities in the 35207 zip code and in the 35214 zip code. And I've indicated this, again, by just different colors. So there's just different species of bacteria living in these communities. That's pretty much as far as we've gotten. We still don't know um, really what the plasmid sequences are. I haven't sort of gotten to that step or been able to analyze that. But we do strongly suspect that, that we will see these pumps or the genes for these pumps present. And then we can continue doing the culture dependent methods to see that a lot of these bacteria are actually showing cross resistance. And again, this is really important because it means that not just the heavy metal pollutants are getting into um, people's bodies in North Birmingham, but it could also be the case that a lot of these environmental bacteria are getting into people's bodies, which is a really big public health concern. Um, so me and my student, Kusha Roberts, are continuing to talk with um, stakeholders from that area to make sure that they are keeping up with our research so that it is communicated in the best way to them that they can make the best use of. Um, so I do want to say that for over 1,300 people currently living in North Birmingham, they don't have to imagine any of this. In fact, they're currently living in a lot of these, um, a lot of this pollution and are most likely disproportionately affected by things like COVID. So what can you do? Um, I heavily encourage you to keep up with what's happening at the Superfund site in North Birmingham as a matter of environmental injustice. You can keep up with local stakeholders, um, like those at PANIC or the People Against Neighborhood Industrial Contamination, or a grassroots organization called GASP, which is focused on environmental justice in the Birmingham community at large. They have put a wonderful documentary together that really highlights the plight of people in North Birmingham. So I wanted to leave you with one quote um, from Martin Luther King Jr. when he wrote in the letter from the Birmingham jail. He said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And he goes on to say, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. With that, thank you for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Wow, round of applause. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really fantastic. So for those of you who have questions, please use the chat feature and um, put your question there. So I will start, Sarah. So do you think that these bacteria that have these special proteins, these pumps, um, have them because of uh, a mutation? Uh, that they, because they lived in that environment, there's been a mutation, so now they express those pumps to help their survival? Yes, that's a really great question. So that is often the case when there are certain environmental selection pressures that sort of um, bacteria or species that have certain genetic mutations are able to survive sort of by happenstance and then they can continue to evolve and respond to the environment. So yes, we, we very much think that is the case. And so uh, one other question, what this pump that you refer to, um, is there anything known 
about it, about the structure of it, and why it's so you know non-selective that it can pump out heavy metals, but also antibiotics and potentially other things. Because typically pumps are pretty precise. I mean, not always, but often they're very precise. But it sounds like this pump is not. Yes, there are lots of technical terms for, for this type of pump. And, and I will save people um, sort of that information that will definitely end up in my dissertation. But I do want to say that these types of pumps are very energetically expensive. So it's important that once the cell sort of has the energy to create them, that they're using it not just for one purpose, but it's important to them that they can sort of use it for multiple purposes if it's so expensive for them to be able to create. It just takes a lot of different parts um, that other types of pumps don't have. So that's probably one, one reason why, why it's able to do so much, so to speak. Right, yeah, fantastic. We have another question, Sarah. How many different types of resistance do these pumps confer in regards to antibiotic resistance? That's a great question, Melissa. So the one that I'm referring to has cross resistance to um, only a handful of different types of antibiotics. So it's, it's really just um, one major class. Um, so I, I think our future work, I, I think this will take a long time to do. But something that I would be really interested in, in fact, is, and, and I think the direction that some of this work is going, is working with the um, community to figure out um, their microbiome using sputum samples and gut samples so we can basically match what we're thinking about to the antibiotic resistance that we see also in the human body. So we're not just seeing like, oh, we're, we're just thinking that these general classes of antibiotics um, have resistance to these types of microbes, but that we actually also see it in humans themselves, which I think can make a, a tighter connection between what antibiotics are actually being used by the cells. Great. Other questions for Sarah? If you don't want to type on the chat, but you have a question, just unmute yourself and you can ask. Okay, so I have another question, Sarah. So what about uh, bacteria in soil in like agricultural areas? So I just wonder about, you know, pesticides that are used by farmers to protect their crops. I would suspect that that will impact the kind of bacteria. Have you thought about that? Or is there any, any concern about that? Well, in terms of agriculture, so actually in the U.S., um, antibiotic usage is highest in agriculture compared to any other sector. So we're actually giving um, the food we eat more antibiotics than, than we actually use in hospitals. So that, that is a huge area of concern and why a lot of uh, different types of meat industries have started um, being more cautious about their use of antibiotics especially because antibiotics, when used in agriculture, are often used to promote growth. So there's, sort of, there's a lot of theories about why this happens, but one of them is because um, it's thought that antibiotics wipe out certain types of bacteria in, in the cow's and intestinal tract or whatever, and, and it actually wipes out some of the bacteria that will help keep certain um, animals leaner. And so some doctors have actually thought that, that might be, there might be some connection between human obesity and early exposure to antibiotics. So to answer your question about the agriculture sector, yes, that is a, a very huge problem um, that, that I think people are thinking very consciously about. Yeah, great. Okay, Sarah. As someone whose actual job is to help people communicate their research, I'm wondering how much success you have with the city of Birmingham in terms of explaining your own research. Clearly you're good at it. Do they take you seriously? That's a really great question. Um, I think it's really important when we're thinking about communities and the academy, the science academy, is that there are notable power imbalances um, between our perceived knowledge and what we're able to do and, um, and communities like those in North Birmingham. So, so I think 
we think about this very cautiously. Um, and I just sort of don't want to go into certain areas and and just say like this is what we're doing. It's important, accept it. But really partnering with them when we're thinking about writing writing certain different certain types of of grant funding and understanding what understanding what their actual needs are and what their perceptions are. And so I don't want to think that I'm phenomenal at it. But so far, me and my student Kusha have sat in several um, small meetings with Panic, and we're in touch with the people at GASP. I, I think it really takes a long term commitment of trying to understand their perspective before we're coming in here and just like saying certain things like I can I can explain my research in in what I feel like a pretty simple way in ways that most people can understand it. But but when we think about explaining it to people who who really need to make use of it. It's important that we're partnering with them and not just telling them about what we're doing. And so they, I think they do take me seriously, but but it really takes more than the, the small amount of meetings that I've been able to do um, to feel like that partnership is is real and it's something that, that we're both benefiting from. Sure, that's a great answer, thanks. Yeah, that is a really great answer. Um, and I think, you know, part of the reason for discoveries in the making is to help scientists learn how to take their very complicated research and distill it in a way that non-experts can understand and understand its impact. And I think um, your, your point about being a partner with them, I know is critical so that they feel like they're not just being told something's wrong and that they will trust and want to work with you and the other scientists who are trying to understand what's happening and with the goal of making it better. So I really applaud what you're doing. It's, it's really fantastic. And you know, it also makes me think about what's going on right now with COVID. And, and you know, we have uh, leadership at NIH talking to the general public and we know that not everybody understands the importance and even believes it, right? So we see it right in front of our eyes, um, the importance of being able to communicate to non-experts in the general public. So anyway, kudos, Sarah, good job. Any other questions for Sarah? Okay, we can all give her a round of applause with our, our little reaction buttons. With our own hands too, great. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for your questions. Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker. So Nicole Connor, and she is going to present developing state-of-the-art technology for helping a turtle in trouble. So Nicole, take it away. Well, hey guys, I'm Nicole. Um, thank you guys for coming out and watching. I know I have lots of friends and family here, so I really appreciate that if you're here. Um, so tonight I want to talk about the Diamondback Terrapin. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an intro of what it is, why it's important, um, and what we know about it, and then why it's important for us to intervene and help them out um, in Alabama especially. So, let's see. So just a quick intro to Diamondback Terrapins. Um, they are found in brackish water systems, so they're found um, in areas where river systems are meeting the open ocean. And so we're getting a mix of freshwater and saltwater that causes a lower salinity than what you'd find out in the open ocean. And interestingly, these are the only turtles that we're finding in these environments. And so they're really closely related to most freshwater turtles, um, but they have several different adaptations I'll talk about in a minute. Um, that allow them to live in these areas. And so they're typically going to be found in a salt marsh, an estuary, or a bay, and it can be anywhere in this yellow highlighted area. So that's all the way from Cape Cod, Massachusetts to essentially the Texas-Mexico border. And so this is a picture of what a typical salt, salt marsh would look like. This is um, the salt marsh that we go to every summer and throughout the year here in Alabama. And like I said, these diamondback terrapins have unique adaptations that allow them to really thrive in these systems. So first of all, they're really speedy, they're highly mobile. Um, if they want to find fresh water, they can go find it really easily. And usually in these areas after rainfall, fresh water is gonna collect on the surface anyways, so they can easily just move to the surface to find fresh water. And then they also have several physiological regulations that allow them to um, 
live in these saltier environments. So they're just not taking in as much salt from the environment. Um, so it's really not as much of a problem and they have extra glands that allow them to excrete any salt that they're taking in orally. And so they can really do well in these ecosystems. This is a picture of the salt marsh that we study here in Alabama. This is our primary um, research site that we go to. It's called Cedar Point Marsh. Um, it is north of Dauphin Island. So if you're driving down the coast to Dauphin Island, you would actually pass this along your way. And I want to point out, um, because it'll be important later on, that there's this main channel that winds its way through the marsh. And so this is affected by the tides. So throughout the day, more water will come in or rush out, and it's really providing nutrients and food to this whole marsh here. Diamondback terrapins are also really important in these salt marsh ecosystems in the food web. So this is a picture of Spartina grass and Litterina. So Litterina are these marsh periwinkle snails. You can see them all um, grabbing onto those um, pieces of grass there. And so Spartina and other grasses in these marsh systems are really that, um, the foundation of these ecosystems. So they're producing all of that primary production and really setting the basis um, for the rest of the ecosystem. These snails will graze all unless they go unchecked. So if you have really high numbers of these snails, then it starts to be a problem because you're starting to deplete that foundation of the um, ecosystem. So this is where the terrapins come in. Uh, they can be considered a keystone species because they will prey on these litterina snails and keep their numbers in check. So as long as we have diamondback terrapins in the system, uh, you can be assured that these numbers aren't going to go out of control, the grass will remain healthy, and it will kind of keep balance in the ecosystem as a whole. So that's just a little bit, um, we could go way further into the biology, but that's just a quick little intro. Um, but so why do they matter? What is the historical significance? Um, and it's kind of complicated. We don't have the best history with them. For example, um, it was once considered a delicacy to have diamondback terrapin stew. It was in really high demand in um, particularly in the Northeast United States. Um, from the late 1800s well into the 1900s. This is a picture that's actually from the 1960s in Baltimore. So it was in high demand for quite some time. Um, and unfortunately, that really took a toll on numbers of diamondback terrapins throughout the US. Um, and that's where Cedar Point Marsh comes back into play. So we focus on Cedar Point Marsh because we find a high population of diamondback terrapins there in Alabama relative to other areas along the coastline. And what we've realized is that this is likely because in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there's actually a terrapin farm there. So they were meeting the demand for terrapins in the Northeast. Um, they were taking terrapins and farming them, and it was really uh, quite large and profitable. Um, so at its peak, they had about 25,000 terrapins living in that marsh. Um, and again, it was quite profitable. So they were shipping them out by the dozen, about $90 a dozen. Um, and there's a famous um, turtle biologist, Archie Carr, who's quoted with saying that um, in the 1950s, diamondback terrapins were actually the most expensive turtle in the world, pound by pound. And they were so important to the economy in Alabama that there's actually a tax on them that still remains in the Alabama tax code today. I think it's about five cents per terrapin if you're collecting it for commercial harvest. Um, this is not really practiced anymore, but it does remain in our tax code. So you can see that it really did used to be an important part of our economy. So again, unfortunately, even though they're raising all of these terrapins here, it really did start to cause a decline in the population across the U.S. And there were several other human impacts as well that continue today. So one of those is just reduction of habitat. So as we continue to develop the coast and build homes there and more infrastructure, we're removing habitat that they could live in. Crab traps and fishing gear that left, get left behind or are in improper areas can be a real problem that can cause several um, instances of drownings. Nesting females will actually migrate to beaches to nest, so they find these narrow strips of beach that are quite rare along the coastline, and so sometimes they have to cross roadways to get there, and so that can cause accidental um, accident or hits by cars and other vehicles. And then the last one is nest depredation. So I have a picture of that in this top right corner here. This is a diamondback terrapin nest 
that we found last summer, it had been probably laid the night before and a raccoon or some other predator, usually they're raccoons, um, dug it up and actually ate the eggs. And the reason that this is a human impact is because without the infrastructure that we've built, so without the roads and the bridges that we've built to get to these areas, we wouldn't see raccoons occurring in these areas. Um, so it's only because we've basically enabled them to move there that they are now a major predator um, of diamondback terrapins, particularly uh, their eggs. And so because of all this, they are now listed in Alabama as a prior priority one species of highest conservational concern. So this isn't um, threatened or endangered, but it's basically one step away. And so this is a crucial point for us to intervene and uh, make sure that they're not getting to the point where they have to be listed as endangered. So this is where UAB comes into play. Uh, we do several things and have been involved with Diamondback Terrapin Conservation for a long time, since way before I started coming here. So we really just jumped in and continued on with a lot and then started some of our own projects as well. So one program I'll talk about quickly, just because it's been covered in a lot of other presentations, is our Head Start program. So this is where we kind of intervene in the life cycle and we actually give terrapins a head start. And so the idea is that we collect nesting females, we actually collect their eggs and incubate them at UAB, and then we raise those terrapins for a couple of years. And the goal is to get them to a size where if they were living in the marsh, they wouldn't be small enough to be eaten. So birds, raccoons, any other predators in the area, they're not gonna eat the larger terrapins. So if we can protect them during that crucial time period and then release them, we're hopefully giving them kind of a head start on life. So that's one program that I've been involved with in my time here. But primarily what I've been involved with uh, working on is monitoring population abundances and looking at new types of methodologies that we can use to do this. So the first one is conducting drone surveys. So we've been doing this for several years now in the lab and I've jumped on this year to really um, take it on and increase the frequency that we're doing drone surveys. So the goal is to monitor when diamondback terrapins are showing up in the marsh and track how high their abundance gets throughout the nesting season and throughout the rest of the year. So this is the drone we use. This is a picture caught mid-flight. I'm here holding the controller, which has a sunshade on it. It's usually not that bulky. And what we do is we pre-program a flight path so this drone will go up and it will actually go down that main channel in the marsh and take a video the whole way. Once we get the video, we go back to the lab. And what I'm looking for is basically what you can see in this bottom left picture here. So what we see for terrapins is just a small white head poking out of the water and then their dark shell below the surface. And so you can imagine this can be a bit tricky to see. So we use TV monitors in the lab, um, we zoom in on it, we get second opinions, um, but usually we're able to pinpoint when we see terrapins. And so I wanted to give you guys an example of what those videos look like. Um, and you'll actually see some terrapins in this video. And it's a little bit jumpy, but hopefully it will work. Right at the beginning here, we see a brown pelican. Um, and we see a lot of birds here, and usually we know whether they're affected by the drone. So this one, for example, it doesn't seem to be affected by the drone. It doesn't fly off. And then as we come up to this point, we're gonna see our first diamondback terrapin. So this is the first one we saw this year. It's down here in the bottom right, and you can see just a tiny little white head in its dark shell. is a white ibis. So again, you see all sorts of different birds here. And then after this goes away, we'll see our second back here. And again, 
appearance in the bottom middle, you see a tiny white head and a darker black body. You see if you're looking at your computer or on a phone, but again, we look at these on larger TV monitors and can zoom in and we can compare it to other um, videos we've seen. And so we're able to track when we see terrapins and um, how often we see them. So the problem with that though is that diamondback terrapins are what we would consider a cryptic species. So they spend most of their lifestyle places we can't see them. So that's either underwater or in the marsh where we're never going to be able to track them with a drone um, or even through in-person surveys. So if you think about it, we're only seeing the diamondback terrapins that come up to the surface to take a breath of air. So how many of them are underwater that we can't see? So this is where my second project has come in. This is the one I focused on primarily the past two years. And it's implementing the use of environmental or eDNA methodologies. So environmental DNA, uh, the concept here is that as organisms are going about their day-to-day -day lives, they're just shedding tissue, they're shedding um, waste, shedding skin, all of these different things that have their DNA and it's just getting deposited into the environment. So if we can sample that, then hopefully we can find out what organisms are in that area um, or we can even look specifically for, is this organism in this sample? Was it here in the last day, in the last hour, things like that. So just to talk you through my process for what I've done here, is we focus on water samples. So we have diamond bacteriopins in the lab that we house. So we have samples where we know diamond bacteriopins are in that water. And then we're also going to the coast and we're collecting water samples. And so once I collect a water sample, what I have to do first is filter it. So we get about one liter of water and we chill it until we use it and then we filter it through this vacuum apparatus. So basically it has a funnel at the top, a vacuum flask at the bottom, and in the middle here, we're pulling it through a membrane filter. So it just looks like this small disc of paper, essentially, but it has a really small pore size. It's about 0.8 microns. And so the idea is that any environmental DNA will get stuck on that membrane filter and the water can pass through. So our samples are usually pretty dirty. Um, they're turbid, as you might say, so there's a lot of suspended sediment in the water. And so it takes a long time to filter these. Um, usually we've gotten it down to about four hours for a liter of water, so it is a bit time consuming. And then our membrane filter will look nice and gross after we finish filtering the water. So then I'll take that filter and I will extract any eDNA from it. And so we have a nice handy kit that gives us a protocol. We um, put this filter in there and we follow procedures that basically break it all down and pull out any eDNA that might be in that sample. The next step is called quantitative PCR. I won't go into all of the details of what that does, but basically what we're doing is we pick out a target sequence of DNA in the diamondback terrapin. So we've found a sequence that we know is unique to diamondback terrapins. And we can target it in this process, and if it's in there, we can amplify it many, many times to the point where we can actually detect that the eDNA is in that sample. Because another thing with eDNA is that it's not as straightforward as taking a blood sample and then purifying it and extracting DNA. Um, it's usually degraded or in low concentrations, so we really rely on this process to be able to amplify it to a concentration where we can detect it. And I do this real time, so I can look at my computer and I can basically track when that um, sample starts to have a high enough concentration that we can detect it. So we use um, fluorescence to do this. So again, I won't explain this too much, but cycles on the bottom here is our progress of time, and then our RFU represents our fluorescence. So if we have a curve that shows up and it starts to peak, we know that it's fluorescing, and so we've replicated and amplified that um, sample of eDNA. So again, I've done this with water that we've sampled at UAB, and so we were quite successful in doing this is basically a positive control. So we knew that we had diamondback terrapins in the water in a small concept or a small volume of water. And then we were able to um, filter it, extract the DNA, and show positive results. Then we wanted to take this to the coast. So we've done two different things with this. The first one is where we've just taken a boat out and taken one liter samples of surface water in different areas. 
So again, on the bottom here is our Cedar Point Marsh, so our main study area. And then we've also seen terrapins in Heron Bay. So Heron Bay is north of Cedar Point Marsh. So again, we just took the boat out, took samples, put them on ice, and took them back to UAB. This one was not very successful in finding Diamondback terrapin DNA. Um, so then we wanted to say, okay, we need to check if we can even detect their DNA if we know that they're in the water. So that's when we moved on to our second experiment where we took this modified crab trap and we put in um, about four or five Diamondback terrapins and they're able to move around freely and um, they're not going to, uh, they're, they're able to get air and swim around and all of that. And we fixed them in a spot in the marsh and then let them sit for several hours. And we took water samples both upstream and downstream of where they were placed and at different distances. And so the goal was to see, you know, when we know that terrapins are in the water, can we detect it and how far away? This one didn't work very well either. And so what we did then was check to see if our methodology was just not working well or what was going on. And we went back and looked at all of the samples that we took from this experiment and we were able to detect DNA from striped mullet. So that's a species of fish that occurs in high abundances basically everywhere we go on the coast in this area. And so we knew that they were in the water. We tested to see if we could find it and we did find it. So now we're at a place of where we're thinking maybe the abundances are too low for the terrapins for us to detect it. And we're starting to think about ways that we can increase the sensitivity and really what we can do moving forward um, to try to get this eDNA methodology um, to be a viable surveying technique. Um, and so next I wanna talk about, just kind of leave you on how we can help terrapins as a whole, um, things that you can do. So if you're ever on the coast and you see a tagged terrapin, that might be from us. So if you're able to take a picture and then let it go, that would be great, let us know about that. Or even if you just see a terrapin that has a yellow tag, you can let us know and that's good information. Um, just a general rule of thumb, pick up after yourself. This has a whole cascade of effects that can happen from leaving trash behind. And especially if you're at the beach, um, keep in mind how that could affect nesting sea turtles and dynamic terrapins. And then if you're ever recreationally fishing in these areas, just be responsible. Um, so yeah, with that, I will take any questions. I'm so impressed with our speakers tonight. Nicole, that was fantastic too. I just thoroughly enjoyed it. It's such important work uh, that you're doing. So I'm wondering about um, this, this method. It seems so innovative to, to think about taking water samples and uh, trying to find if the, if the animals are there. Is that something that you guys just came up with or is that strategy that other environmentalists have used to try to study animal populations? Yeah, so it's relatively new in science. It's about um, a decade old, I would say. Um, a lot of the first studies were looking for similar things where they're focused on single species detection, like we would call it. So the first study I know of um, in an aquatic system was in 2008. They were looking for detecting the American bullfrog. And then there have been other studies looking for the hellbender salamander, which has a really cryptic lifestyle. Um, it's been used to detect invasion fronts of invasive fish species. And then now, the more we understand about it, other people are starting to look at a different approach where they're looking at the biodiversity within a given sample. And they can do that with soil or water. Um, so there, there's been a lot that's come out in the past decade. Um, it's still new enough that we're kind of still working out what everything means. Um, and so it's not necessarily like, a golden solution to surveying, um, but it does seem to be really promising if you can kind of figure out what works for you. Right. You know, there's similarities between your strategy and what Sarah is doing to understand the different species, species of, not species, but the different types of bacteria. But I just hadn't really thought of that as a way to track uh, animal populations. I'm wondering, I'll ask one more question and then I'll let other people. I'm wondering um, what time of day you've collected the water samples, because I'm wondering 
if the turtles are more active at a certain time of day and maybe your sample would be, you know, there'd be a higher amount of DNA from the turtles if it's, you know, if there's a time of day where they're more active and there's more in the water or something. Is that even a relevant question? Yeah, it is. It is a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're kind of limited by just when we can get to the coast and the amount of time that it takes to do this. So typically we've collected midday um, so that we have time to do everything. Um, but what we found with terrapins when they're nesting is usually they're coming up on the beaches to nest at dawn and dusk. So it might be that they're swimming through the water around those times as well. Um, and so it might, you know, especially also if you consider that it's gonna be hotter you know, July midday, they may just be spending more time underwater or in different areas um, out of that direct sunlight. So that's definitely something that's worth considering. Yeah. Great. Okay, another question. You mentioned behavioral effects of drones. How do you know animals are affected by the drones around and do the turtles ever notice them? Yeah, great question. Um, so with birds, it's quite obvious. Uh, usually we'll see a variety of different birds that are just hanging out um, looking for food or just swimming through the area. And as the drone approaches, you'll see it fly off in the opposite direction. Um, with terrapins, every once in a while, you'll see them duck underwater. And of course, you can't necessarily say for sure it was the drone that caused that behavior, um, but it does occur every once in a while. And so we think that there is probably it's probably worth looking into the altitude at which we're flying the drones um, and how it's affecting them. You know, we're not really focused on birds. It's something that we just see a lot of, and so we've made notes of that. Um, but in the future, it would be good to, to note um, ways that we can definitely minimize those effects that we're having on them. Okay, Nicole, you said that your method for collecting eDNA has been successful in showing footprints left behind from striped mullet more so than from the terrapin. Why do you think this may be? Do the mullet have certain traits or actions that leave behind more eDNA more so than the terrapin? Uh, that's a great question too. So my first idea on that is um, not knowing as much about the, their biologies, it's just that they're occurring in such high abundances so when we're down on the coast, um, you know, the water is quite turbid and murky, but we can still see so many fish swimming through because they're tailing you know, near the surface and we can see them moving around as we drive the boat through. So we think they're just in such high abundances that um, there's a higher concentration of their DNA in the water, but it could also be a biological factor. So if the terrapins are just not eating as much and not excreting as much waste or not shedding as much tissue, whereas the fish are eating rapidly and excreting more waste, um, that could definitely contribute to that as well. That makes sense. What's the, what's the lifespan of these turtles? I want to say they can live into their teens, um, up to like 20, 30, I think. Um, they definitely mature, they are maturing later on, um, so, you know, they're not as, they're not ready to reproduce really until they're like five or six years old. It, it varies between male and female. Um, but yeah, definitely not as long as sea turtles. Great. So are you going to continue this work and get your PhD? That's not the plan right now. Um, I do think that it would be a study that's worth carrying on. Um, maybe someone who comes into the lab next can take it on and, and carry it to, to a better place where I'll be able to leave it. Um, but yeah. Okay, another of, course, question. The, of course, the Dean of the grad school is gonna ask you about <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, Nicole, do you expect the lack of human traffic in the area that you study due to COVID-19 to have any impact on the terrapins as we've seen with other species around the world? I think it would have an impact on um, if there's any roadside mortalities with um, nesting terrapins. Um, but usually the sites, at least in Alabama, the sites where we see them nesting are not beaches that humans are accessing. Um, so for example, at Cedar Point Marsh, it's a very narrow strip of beach. It's this shell hash that's kind of a coarse like oyster shell material. 
And so these areas aren't usually places where people are going to be. So I don't think, at least in Alabama, that it's going to have a significant effect um, on it. But for different populations in the Northeast, um, I'm, I'm sure that just overall human activity being lower does have a benefit to it. Um, I'm sure there's less, you know, pollution in the waters. I know I've seen reports of, of lower levels of pollution. And, and so I think just there are probably many benefits to it, but as far as direct human interaction, I'm not sure that that's really been affected. Great, are there other questions for Nicole? Okay, help me thank Nicole for a great talk. Very inspiring, uh, just really terrific. And both of our speakers tonight, let's give another round of applause to both of our speakers. And I really appreciate all of you attending our Discoveries in the Making and all of the questions. Uh, this is why we're here, is to share the discoveries that we're making. So uh, please uh, come back for our next session in June. I will be back here. And we uh, wish you all a very healthy and safe uh, next few weeks. Uh, take care and make sure you wash your hands. Thanks.